You walk into your first patient's room of the day. Who's there for foot pain? But then when you talk to them, you realize they have bilateral foot tingling numbness. And you examine them and they have a sensory level that goes all the way up to their belly button. And you have no idea what to do with this person. And the next patient that rolls into the emergency department after a severe MBC, you find that they cannot move their arms and legs and they're bradycardic and hypotensive. And you wonder, what is the cause of this patient's shock? In this episode of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine, we will talk about transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre syndrome, specifically how to pick up on these rare diagnoses and identify them correctly in the ED. We will also talk about traumatic spinal cord injuries, including imaging as well as complications to watch out for. With you is Dr. Danya Koja. I'm an emergency physician who practices in Florida. And this is Dr. Wendy Chang, an emergency physician and neurointensivist in the Baltimore, Washington area. And this is the March episode of Critical Decisions in Emergency Medicine podcast. And if you don't know what Critical Decisions is, what are you waiting for? We are ASAP's official CME publication, and each month we discuss two lessons that are either bread and butter emergency medicine or things that are cutting edge. There are a lot more features than just the two lessons. We will also discuss ECG characteristics of atrial flutter and diphenhydramine overdose this month. So let's get started. So for our first lesson, we have bundle of nerves, transverse myelitis, and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Thank you to Dr. Estela Lindquist and Kathleen Stefanos for writing this lesson. And guess what? They are here with us to talk about it. So Dr. Estela and Kathleen, tell us more about you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. I am a second year pediatric and emergency medicine combined resident at the University of Maryland. Hi, and I'm Kat Stefanos. I'm a Baltimore native who recently returned to the area. I work at the University of Maryland. I trained in pediatrics and emergency medicine as well. Awesome. We have such specialized powerhouses here with us today. So why did you two decide to write about this topic? So among common ED presentations for weakness are rare but serious disorders like transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre syndrome that can be associated with life-threatening complications. I actually cared for a patient in our pediatric emergency department last year who was ultimately diagnosed with transverse myelitis. And following along with his case really helped me to see what drastic improvement you can have with accurate diagnosis and treatment early on. Similarly, I've taken care of several patients with both Guillain-Barre as well as transverse myelitis. And I think I really felt like I had a lot of room to grow. So as I started reading more and diving deeper, it became clear that there was a lot of room for physician education in the area. All right. Well, those are great reasons to do this because as you guys pointed out, it can be quite scary because we don't see them as often, especially on the emergency medicine side of life. So let's start with the basics. What is transverse myelitis? Transverse myelitis is an inflammatory disorder of the spinal cord that causes motor, sensory, and autonomic dysfunction. It can be idiopathic or secondary to autoimmune disorders like lupus, parainfectious disease, paraneoplastic syndromes, and even toxins or drugs like from a brown recluse spider or heroin, for example. It's also part of a spectrum of neuroinflammatory conditions, so providers should always also be thinking about multiple sclerosis or neuromyelitis optica. Got it. Then what about Guillain-Barre then? So Guillain-Barre is the most common cause of acute flaccid paralysis worldwide since we started developing the polio vaccine and that became widely available. It's an autoimmune-mediated acute inflammatory polyradiculoneuropathy It's often preceded by a GI or an upper respiratory illness. Classically, it's associated with Campylobacter, and that's due to its gangliocide that cross-reacts with a similar antigen on the peripheral nerves. It's also associated with several medications, including rituximab and certain vaccines, though there is some thought that many of the vaccines are likely more temporally related as opposed to directly associated with the disease. All right. Well, those are great definitions. So how do these patients present? There must be a reason we're talking about both at the same time. Good question. So what I like to think of for transverse myelitis is that it can present as a triad of motor, sensory, or autonomic dysfunctions. 
For motor dysfunction, weakness often involves the lower extremities with areflexia initially, but as the disease evolves, patients can have upper motor signs as well. Sensory symptoms can be numbness, paresthesias, or band-like dysthesias so that will follow dermatomal distributions. And then as far as autonomic symptoms, patients can report urinary or bowel incontinence or retention or even sexual dysfunction. The timing of the symptom onset is also critical to diagnose because if you have a patient with rapid onset, say less than four hours, this is more concerning for possible spinal cord ischemia, whereas progression of more than 21 days or so is more suggestive of MS or another myelopathy. And then Guillain-Barre has a lot of similarities that cross over the association with other viral illnesses, as well as the neurologic findings, autonomic dysfunction all occurs in Guillain-Barre as well. For Guillain-Barre, there's often back pain associated with the symptoms due to inflammation of the nerve roots, but classically it is ascending weakness with areflexia. Now, this is important to note there are multiple different forms of Guillain-Barre, so depending upon the subtype, you can have paresthesias or no sensory component. And in extremely rare cases, you can actually have only a sensory component with no motor involvement. Miller-Fisher syndrome also presents with ophthalmoplegia and other cranial neuropathies and ataxia and can be mistaken for a stroke. And they all have an indolent course over approximately four weeks. Again, similar to the transverse myelitis patients, there's sort of a slow progression and prolonged phase of illness. Great pearls. Definitely a lot of crossover between the presentations. So how do we make these diagnoses then in AD? When talking about transverse myelitis, there's actually a transverse myelitis corsicium working group diagnostic criteria. It can be seen in table two of our article if you go back and look. But really, in the ED, we should consider transverse myelitis if patients have bilateral motor, sensory, and autonomic symptoms that include a sensory level, and as well as progression of symptoms, like we mentioned, between four hours and 21 days. Now, workup in the emergency department is going to look like a lumbar puncture to look at CSF, and also an MRI to look at inflammation of the spinal cord. Your MRI is going to show probably gadolidium enhancement. And then your CSF is going to show pleocytosis or else an elevated IgG index. As ED providers, it's important to also exclude other conditions like mass lesions, MS, or infections. Meanwhile, Guillain-Barre is a clinical diagnosis, always my favorite. We get to diagnose it purely based on the symptomatology in the emergency department. It is sensory deficits and weakness in more than one limb with areflexia. A lumbar puncture with CSF showing cytoalbuminocytologic dissociation and nerve conduction studies are done to support the diagnosis, but may not be revealing depending upon the timing of the disease and may not be revealing at all throughout the course of the illness. Got it. So we have to actually examine patients and do clinical diagnoses. All right. Okay. So we cannot just do tests on everyone. Um, Any pearls about the workup of these conditions in the ED? So as mentioned earlier, since transverse myelitis presents with myelopathy signs and symptoms, it's always important for providers to obtain an urgent MRI, if you can get an urgent MRI, with gadolinium of the entire spine. If unable to get this urgent MRI, providers should just go ahead and obtain a CT or a CT myelogram to at least rule out compressive lesions that would need surgical intervention. With Guillain-Barre, we're going to be making sure we obtain enough CSF for standard studies and viral panels, including HSV, varicella, CMV, looking for oligoclonal bands and cytology. Importantly, a white blood cell count of greater than 50,000 is going to indicate likely some other pathology besides Guillain-Barre. And don't forget to look for other infectious causes. HIV seroconversion classically can present similarly to Guillain-Barre. Additionally, things such as syphilis or tick-borne illnesses can have some neurologic presentations as well. Consider metabolic causes as well and thyroid and immune conditions. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit about how do we manage these patients in the ED. We're going to start like we do with everyone. We're going to do the ABCs. Patients can present with dysrhythmias or dysphagia, so you have to think of this with risk for aspiration. Monitor for respiratory decompensation with your negative inspiratory force. 
If you get a NIF that's less than negative 20 to negative 30, you should be really ready to intubate your patient. Delaying this can cause worse outcomes for your patient. Autonomic dysfunction, as we mentioned earlier, comes with both of these diagnoses and can present with dysrhythmias. So make sure they are on a monitor the entire time they're in your emergency department. And consider that they may need a urinary catheter because of urinary retention due to this as well. Those are great pearls about how to watch out for patients that are going to decompensate. Is there any treatment that's specific for transverse myelitis and Guillain-Barre? With transverse myelitis, we're always thinking steroids. High-dose steroids are used to treat the spinal cord inflammation that's associated with transverse myelitis. Data extrapolated from studies in multiple sclerosis has shown that early treatment with steroids improves outcomes and likelihood of the full recovery of the patient. IVIG or plasma exchange, as you may have heard, can also be recommended by our neurology consultant. Guillain-Barre's treatment typically does not start in the emergency department. This is because it's treated with intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma exchange. Both of these are considered to be equally effective. There is some indication that if IVIG does not improve the symptoms, that plasma exchange may be the secondary treatment. IVIG is often more preferred because it's less costly, it's more available, and it requires less resources. You don't need to transfer these to a tertiary care facility. Steroids are not used in Guillain-Barre and may actually have some association with worse outcomes. Got it. So since both of you are pediatric specialists, how do these diseases differ in our pediatric population? Great question. We had to put a plug in there for our pediatric patients. So for transverse myelitis, the cases are predominantly triggered by recent vaccination or viral illness, but for a lot of our pediatric populations, autoimmune diseases are often triggered by this as well, so cannot rule in the diagnosis. As compared to adults, pediatric patients will have a better functional recovery, but in general, they'll also present with our triad of autonomic, motor, sensory dysfunction, and the workup in the emergency department is very similar. Guillain-Barre typically affects young children while it affects older adults, so children less than five years of age. They typically have a shorter duration of illness and a faster recovery, though interestingly, mortality and complete recovery rates seem to be fairly similar across the board. Autonomic dysfunction is more prevalent, however, in children, so it's more important to keep them closely monitored. And the Miller-Fisher variant is much more rare. Well, thank you both for taking us through such a great review of very important and potentially quite scary diseases. Any take-home points for our listeners? I would say always remember transverse myelitis triad, motor, sensory, autonomic dysfunction. Never delay your administration of IV steroids once your diagnosis is made. And always remember, as we mentioned, start with your ABCs. For Guillain-Barre, think about motor weakness, sensory deficits, and areflexia. And we really need to remember this is a clinical diagnosis, and we should not be relying on that lumbar puncture that we're all taught about to diagnose this disease. (laughs) Remember, the classic findings of the oligoclonal bands may not occur until much later, and similarly, nerve conduction studies cannot be relied upon. Reflecting again on what Taylor mentioned, keeping a close eye on these patients, repeat evaluations, because they can decompensate just while they're in your emergency department. So not just that first exam, but a recheck on them as well. Thank you both for joining us. This was a great article and obviously a great conversation about these topics. Thank you both for joining us and looking forward to having you again on our podcast with another fun article. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And keeping up with the neuro theme, our LLSA Literature Review is an article by Powers that was published in New England Journal in 2020 entitled Acute Ischemic Stroke. There have been a lot of changes in the past five years on how to manage stroke, and I think it's always helpful to have a refresher on what the current standard of care is and the evidence behind that, specifically the timing of treatment options. So let's talk about these windows that we have these days. It can definitely get confusing, all these time windows we have to pay attention to in caring for patients with acute ischemic stroke. So let's start with what we've known for quite a while, which is if the patient is presenting 
within four and a half hours from symptom onset or really last known well, and they meet the inclusion criteria for thrombolysis, then you should give your thrombolytic of choice. Now, if these patients are also presenting with symptoms that are concerning enough for a large vessel occlusion, you would need to get a CT angiogram or MR angiogram to consider whether or not the patient may be a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. And this is with or without the administration of thrombolytics. All right, that sounds quite simple and straightforward. What's next? Well, the next time window we often talk about is from four and a half to nine hours from time of last known well. These patients are not eligible generally for IV thrombolytics based on the traditional studies that we've practiced by for a long time. These patients should get a CT or MR angiogram to evaluate if they have a large vessel occlusion because they could still be a candidate for a mechanical thrombectomy. Now, there are some, of course, newer studies that suggest that very specialized patients, if they still have significant mismatch on perfusion imaging, could be a candidate for thrombolysis. All right, got it. So maybe, maybe thrombolytics for some people after the four and a half hours. Quite interesting. How about after the nine hours? What options do we have then? Please don't tell me more thrombolytics. (laughs) We're still considering whether or not the patient is a candidate for mechanical thrombectomy. So even up until 24 hours of time of last known well, these patients should still get a CT or MR angiogram to evaluate for the thrombectomy question. All right. Is there anything that we can do after the 24 hours? In general, after 24 hours, this is when we're starting to think about how to reduce a patient's risk for future stroke. And so patients may be evaluated to see if they need dual antiplatelet therapy as a combination of aspirin and clopidogrel for 21 days after acute ischemic stroke has been shown to lower the risk of future strokes. All right. Final question. Altaplase versus synecdoplase. Well, we know that altaplase is better studied, but there is a lot of growing evidence for tenecteplase also. It has a longer half-life and it can be given just as a single bolus rather than an infusion. So it is easier to administer. So I think that is why we're seeing a lot of institutions switching over in their thrombolytic choice. Currently though, these two really don't have any differences in effectiveness based on the existing studies. This is a fantastic article that is full of pearls, and this is such a succinct review of that. So definitely, if you have some time to go back to the original article, it's totally worth it. So even more neurotopics, our critical image this month is of a brain lesion in a 17-year-old patient, so pediatric, who is coming in with focal seizures. And it is extremely interesting. The article itself reviews the indications for and the types of brain imaging in pediatric patients. First things first, a patient coming in with a headache with no neural abnormalities should not get any imaging. The rate of abnormality is less than 1%. This is not an ED thing for us to be doing. So let's clarify that piece. So imaging, which is MRI both for this age group and for the diagnoses that we're worried about, are indicated in things like focal neurologic abnormalities, if a patient has evidence of increased intracranial pressure or altered level of consciousness, if they have seizures, even including focal seizures, or if they have a suspected intracranial infection. Our first choice is to do it without any contrast. Now, if we're suspecting an infection off the bat, so like meningitis, encephalitis, and abscess, then we can add gadolinium. Or if the non-con MRI shows a suspected malignancy, infection, or inflammation, then we can add that gadolinium. And we need to remember that infection can masquerade as a neoplasm. Now, on the imaging, if you were to find multiple lesions, this may be due to metastatic disease, demyelinating disorders, inflammation, or infection. Whereas if you find just a solitary lesion, then they're more likely to be a primary brain neoplasm. Certain patterns also can help us figure out what the process is. Some tumors may favor specific anatomic locations. And then if you find lesions within the white matter, that may more indicate a demyelinating process like multiple sclerosis. But it's still important to remember that imaging alone does not provide a definitive diagnosis. Which is why it's important to do a good history and physical and interpret things in the context of the rest of the clinical picture. 
check this case out and prepare to have your mind completely blown. And speaking of pediatric, our clinical pediatrics this month, we talk about ECG findings in pediatric diphenhydramine overdose. So it's a case of a 15-year-old after an intentional ingestion of 500 milligrams of diphenhydramine, and they present just one hour after this ingestion. Their initial ECG showed a QRS of 109 milliseconds and QTC of 445 milliseconds, so prolonged. Now, poison control recommended giving charcoal since they're presenting quite early after their ingestion and bicarb for these ECG findings. But you keep repeating the ECG to see if it is responding to the bicarb therapy and the patient still has a persistently prolonged QRS and QTC. Diphenhydramine is a first-generation antihistamine, so it blocks sodium channels and potassium channels in the myocardium, leading to the prolonged QRS and QTC, which are treated with bicarb. And that can either be repeated or the patient can be initiated on a bicarb drip. Remember that it also causes sedation and anticholinergic symptoms. If a patient develops agitation or seizures, then benzos are the answer to all of life's problems, apparently. <laughs> That's true. That is true. It's quite scary, though. It's such a common medication we have around, and it's one of the top 15 drugs involved in overdose deaths. And keeping up with even more EKGs, our critical ECG this month is atrial flutter with variable block. And we're talking about like the bread and butter review of, of flutter, which I don't know. Are we supposed to call things bread and butter? People apparently don't want to eat bread or butter these days, so not sure what we should call it. The smoothie of... Emergency medicine? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> All right. So our smoothie review of flutter and right bundle branch block in detail, which is a great refresher. Quite a few interesting images, the details, those things. A couple of pearls. Remember that flutter waves are best seen in the inferior leads. And as for right bundle branch block, you can have ST depressions and T-wave inversions in V1, plus also sometimes V2. Any ST elevation or an upright T wave in those leads should be very concerning for ischemia. So keep an eye out for them. Great reminders. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit to trauma. Our critical cases in orthopedics and trauma this month is a case of ankle pain after the patient had a recent laceration to their ankle from metal fencing. They did seek medical care at an urgent care and had the laceration repaired but now they're returning to the ED with the pain. And you find that there's a ball-like deformity that's proximal to this well-healing laceration. And the patient has limited plantar flexion and, and on passive dorsiflexion, they also have pain. Let me think for a second. Must be a missed Achilles tendon laceration. Definitely something to watch out for in patients who are coming in with ankle pain. It's a clinical diagnosis and there's no consensus on whether imaging should be obtained to support the diagnosis, but ultrasound has excellent sensitivity and specificity. Check out these great images and definitely think of this diagnosis in your next ankle pain that you see. And keeping up with the ortho theme, our critical procedure this month is a mallet finger splint. And mallet finger can happen from like a tendon rupture or an avulsion fracture. And these patients need to be placed in a splint with like extension or even slight hyperextension. Now we can either get commercially available ones, or if we don't have any, we can fashion one ourselves. See, we're talking about fashion today. Yes, exactly. Definitely make this split <laughs> nice and pretty. So how are we supposed to do this? It's quite important to not include the proximal interpharyngeal joint so that we can actually move the finger otherwise. So it must end at the middle phalanx. It needs to be in slight hyperextension, as we said, so around 5 to 10 degrees at the DIP joint. And we need to assess for ongoing subluxation at the DIP joint after the splinting. If it continues to be really subluxed, then that patient may need surgery. And we need to give the patient very clear instructions. The DIP joint should be in continual extension for a full six to eight weeks. Even when they're cleaning the area, they need to put their finger on a flat surface so they can clean it. They should be instructed to avoid intermittently bending their finger to check if it's working or not, because then the clock should restart. I'm thinking of it the way I think of epistaxis. If you take a peek and take that pressure off your nose, then guess what? The clock starts all over again. That's a great reminder. Mm -hmm. 
So even more trauma, and just in case that was not enough neuro for you, Wendy, for one episode, our second lesson of this issue is show some backbone, traumatic spinal cord injury. Thank you to doctors Carlos Rodriguez, Alan Winger, Ryan Paolo, and Andrew Glunk for writing this lesson. Thankfully, spinal cord injuries are not that common, but they are scary and can be quite devastating. Early recognition and care are essential, and that's why we're doing this review. I think recognizing a complete spinal cord injury is somewhat obvious, but incomplete spinal cord injuries can be quite tricky. So let's review the common types and how they present. So the most common incomplete spinal cord injury is central cord syndrome, which usually happens from hyperextension of the C-spine, and that affects the motor function of the upper extremities more than the lower. Those patients need to be immobilized, surgery is for most, and no steroids in the ED because that doesn't really help anything. The second type of incomplete spinal cord injury is anterior cord syndrome. It usually actually happens from injury to the anterior spinal artery in aortic surgery, but in trauma, it can either be from like direct anterior injury or from flexion of the neck. And the treatment is usually PTOT. Surgery doesn't usually help, but obviously involve our surgical colleagues. The last and least common is bronze cord syndrome, which results from hemisection of the posterior spinal cord. It's either a penetrating injury or from a lateral cord compression from a spinal fracture. Patients are gonna present with ipsilateral loss of motor vibration and proprioception with contralateral loss of pain and temperature. Surgery is considered for decompression and these patients usually have a good outcome. Okay, let's start really from even the beginning. When a patient presents with potential spinal cord injury, when are we supposed to use cervical collars and backboards? It's a delicate balance. We don't want to exacerbate an existing injury and just leave them without any support, but using collars and backboards have their drawbacks. We know that they cause patient discomfort and dissatisfaction. Collars complicate airway management and intubation and obscure traumatic injuries to the neck, and backboards limit the expansion of the lungs, worsening respiratory function. ASAP's joint policy statement with the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and the National Association of EMS Physicians lists five indications for immobilization. Acutely altered level of consciousness, midline neck or back pain or tenderness, focal neurologic deficits, whether numbness or weakness, anatomic deformity of the spine, and the presence of distracting injuries. Neither is warranted for penetrating injuries, and emphasis is on clearing patients and taking them off of those things as soon as feasible and safe. That makes sense. So now let's move on to imaging. When are we supposed to image the C-spine? Seems like we often get it as a combo deal, just CT head and (laughs) C-spine. Yes, that's what it sounds like. However, there are clinical decision rules that we are all familiar with and should be using a little more often. The two that we talk about all the time are Nexus and the Canadian C-spine rule. Nexus is National Emergency X-Radiography Utilization Study. The criteria is in order to defer imaging, a patient must meet all five criteria. Absence of midline tenderness, absence of focal neurologic deficits, a normal level of alertness and cautiousness, no evidence of intoxication, and no distracting injuries. As for the Canadian C-spine rule, it's a little more complex in the sense that you have three assessments in sequential order. One, the patient should not have any high-risk factors. High-risk factors are age older than 65, having a dangerous mechanism of injury, so falling from more than three feet, so almost a meter or five stairs, an axial loading injury, a high-speed motor vehicle collision, a rollover or ejection, a bicycle collision, or a motorized recreational vehicle injury, or if a patient has paresthesias in their extremities. Now, if all of these high-risk factors are negative or not present, then we need to start looking for a low risk factor, like a simple rear end motor vehicle collision, a person who's in a sitting position in the ED, if the patient is ambulatory at any time following the accident, if the onset of neck pain is actually delayed, and they don't have any midline cervical spine tenderness. If they have any of these low risk factors, at that point, then we're allowed to ask them to rotate their cervical spine to the right, to the left, 45 degrees. If they can do that, then no imaging. That's an important refresher on these commonly used clinical decision rules. 
So what about older adults? Do they all need to be imaged? Ah, the million dollar questions, Wendy. Actually, there's quite a few million dollar questions in this article. Now, the Canadian C-spine rule cannot be used at all in patients above 65 because that's a you know, high risk factor, so they're automatically excluded. However, Nexus does not have an age limit, and there have been studies that validate that in the older patient population. So you can consider that. There's also another study from 2021 that has yet to be validated, but that specifically focused on older patients and had a sensitivity of 100%. So hopefully, hopefully that's going to come to an ED near us at some point in the near future. So if a patient does not have any external evidence of trauma above the clavicles, did not suffer from altered mental status, and has no tenderness on palpation of the C-spine, you might be able to get away without any imaging. At the end of the day, you need to follow your clinical gestalt and fully assess those patients. That's great to hear. Hopefully further research will allow us to decrease the amount of imaging done in older adults. So let's say the decision has been made to get some imaging. Should we get x-rays or CAT scans? Ah, the second million dollar question. And I think the answer to that is really dependent on age. In peds, we're scared of radiation. So there's some advocacy for like screening with an x-ray. And then if there's a concern on that, then you can CT them. But there's a study that's actually mentioned in the article where a third of clinically significant injuries were missed on x-ray alone. PCARN has nothing to say here, so they can't help us. And then somehow when people turn 18, it's fine. We can just irradiate everybody and their mother. So that's totally cool because radiation is no longer a concern. Now, the East Association says, you know what, just CT everybody if you need to. Don't use x-rays. They are useless. Well, they don't say useless per se, but basically don't use x-rays. Now, the American College of Surgeons Best Practice Guidelines from March of 2022 says that the sensitivity of CT is 98 to 100 percent. And they're talking about CTs that are coming in from like reconstruction of your chest, abdomen, and pelvis, not necessarily like re-imaging people. So they're kind of like saying, well, it's really great. So maybe that, but they don't explicitly say that. Now, for older adults, we advocate for a lower threshold for CTs because they have an increased injury risk. And remember... When you're thinking of serious injuries, the most common locations for spine injuries, other than the C-spine, of course, for the thoracic and lumbar spine is in the T10 to L2 region. Okay. What about MRIs? Let's just get that in everybody. Great. So um, you're just accepting everybody's transfers for MRIs. Got it, Wendy. I'll be transferring all my patients from Florida to Maryland to you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, obviously that's not going to happen. And MRIs are not that great in the sense that they have no value for detecting bony injuries or unstable ligamentous injuries in a patient with a negative CT. The miss rate in those patients who have negative CTs, if we don't do an MRI, is three in 1,000. That's not a lot. And the majority of these are actually not even clinically significant. MRIs are most helpful in patients who have a known significant spinal injury to evaluate for the spinal cord itself or nerve root involvement, or in patients who are going to the operating room and need some pre-op planning, which at that point should not be an ED problem. Got it. So we got all the imaging that is appropriate in that clinical context, and the patient does have a fracture. What do we do now? Well, the first question is, are they stable or unstable? We're not talking about the patient, but we're talking about the fracture. Unstable spinal injuries pose a risk of irritation or damage to the spinal cord or nerve roots, which can lead to permanent neurologic deficits if left unstable. For C-spine injuries, the simple rule is that they're all unstable until proven otherwise. For cervical spine, we always talk about Jefferson bit off a hangman's thumb. I don't know if that's what you learned in residency one year, if that's what you still use, and that's kind of detailed in table two because Jefferson did not bite anybody, but it's a list of mostly atlantoaxial fractures that are unstable. However, this mnemonic does not recognize other injuries as much. There are a couple of decision rules that talk about non-atlantoaxial fractures that are unstable. One is called the SLIC, which is the subaxial injury classification scale, and the other one is called the TLIX, which is the thoracolumbar injury classification scale. And those tools are available on MDCalc and summarized in the article as well. Basically, based on the fracture morphology, involvement of the posterior ligament, and the neurological findings on examination, you get to determine if this patient has a stable or an unstable injury. 
and therefore you would know if they need immediate operative decompression stabilization or that they're stable enough to be discharged with a hard collar or if we're talking about a TL fracture, a thoracolumbosacral orthosis brace, an outpatient MRI, and a follow-up with a specialist. Okay. Now, last but definitely not least, what is neurogenic shock and how is it managed? Well, let's clarify an important differentiation of definitions between neurogenic shock and spinal shock. They are separate pathologies on the same spectrum. Spinal shock describes the sudden change in physiology that happens immediately after spinal cord injuries. The loss of spinal cord function is at the level of the injury, anesthesia, loss of bladder and bowel control, loss of reflexes, and flaccid paralysis. Neurogenic shock is a component of the spinal shock. And it specifically refers to the resulting hypotension, bradycardia, and hypothermia that results from the loss of the sympathetic innervation. So basically a type of distributive shock. Although the patients feel warm on the outside because of the pooling of the blood, they're actually hypothermic on their core temp. So don't be fooled with their warm extremities. Now, managing the neurogenic shock in the acute phase includes vasopressor support, reversal of the bradycardia with atropine and glycopyrrolate, and maintaining their normothermia, and maybe high dose steroids, call your surgeon, call your neurointensivist, call Wendy, and see if that's what they want to do. Many experts suggest the MAP push, which is basically treating the hypotension all the way up to 85. So even if they're not even technically hypotensive, you still want them to have a really high MAP. The idea is that to maintain adequate spinal perfusion and prevent further ischemic injury. Well, thank you, Dania, for taking us through this lesson. There are a lot of great pros and refreshers for us to consider in caring for these patients with traumatic spinal cord injuries. I think starting from the very beginning, if a patient has a traumatic injury and you're worried about a spinal cord injury, especially if they have an ultramental status, midline neck or back pain, focal neurological deficits, anatomic deformity of the spine, or distracting injuries, these are the patients that you would need to immobilize their spine using cervical collars and backboards. In terms of imaging, we're all familiar with our clinical decision rules, but it's always good to also refresh all the criteria of the Nexus and Canadian C-spine rule. Specifically, though, Canadian C-spine rule can't be used in our older adults since it definitely specifies that it excludes those that are greater than 65 years of age. And so in our older adults, we can use the Nexus. Hopefully that can help us reduce some of the imaging done in our older adults. In terms of the specific mode of imaging, well, I think it really depends on many factors such as patient age, etc. But it is also important to remember that while cervical spine injuries is the most common, the most common area for thoracolumbar injuries is at T10 to L2. And so imaging may require the entire spine, including those regions. Most of these patients are going to be assumed to have unstable fractures until obviously your consultants weigh in and provide recommendations on their final mode of immobilization or stabilization. But specifically from kind of their neurologic presentations, they obviously can present with a spectrum of weakness, whether it's a complete spinal cord injury with no motor sensory function at all or incomplete spinal cord injury, oftentimes from central cord or anterior cord injuries. They can also present in a shock state, and it's a good reminder that both neurogenic shock and spinal shock are really within the same spectrum, which is worsening of spinal function distal to the level of injury. This can involve, of course, worsening weakness and sensory function, but also can involve loss of sympathetic tone, causing the actual bradycardia, hypotension, hypothermic state. So we will want to, of course, support the patient in their neurogenic shock with fluids, vasopressors, maybe even treatment of the bradycardia with atropine or glycopyrrolate. And oftentimes we may even induce hypertension with a MAP push, quote unquote, maintaining a MAP greater than 85 to improve spinal perfusion. Well, thank you, Wendy, for summarizing this article. And thank you again to the authors for writing it. Now, our drug box this month is talking about removal of the X waiver requirement, which is quite relevant to us in the ED. Really, we're talking about, of course, buprenorphine. So for those in the U.S., prior to January 2023, we had to apply for an X waiver to prescribe buprenorphine from the ED. 
but now we can prescribe it without this particular logistic, just like any Schedule 3 drug. So an example of a protocol on how to do this is for patients with mild to moderate opiate withdrawal, utilizing the clinical opiate withdrawal scale, which is the COWS score. If the patient has a score of greater than or equal to 12, you want to give 4 milligrams of buprenorphine, reassess in 1 to 2 hours, and if they're still symptomatic with a cow's greater than the equal to the six, you can give an additional four milligrams. Once your cow score is less than six, then you can discharge with the buprenorphine combined with the naloxone. On day two, as the patient returns for additional treatment, you want to first start with a single dose that is equal to what they got in total from day one and monitored them for one to two hours. If their cow score is still greater than or equal to six, you will want to give an additional four milligrams. And ultimately, the max total dose is 16 milligrams on day two. If their symptoms are adequately relieved, then you can discharge them with a precise number of days and depending on their, of course, circumstances on ability to follow up, etc. And last but not least, our tox box this month is vinyl chloride exposure, which is a colorless, sweet-smelling hydrocarbon that's widely used in the production of PVC, which is a substance that's ubiquitous in the construction of pipes, coatings, and 60s fashion as well. Now, exposure happens at production sites and from release during the shipment. And patients can present with an acute toxicity like headache, dizziness, seizures, pneumonitis, and dysrhythmias from sensitization to catecholamine, or they can come in also with like irritation of their mucous membranes. Now, patients with long-term exposures are going to come in with very vague symptoms, but your typical thing or the thing that's going to be a tip-off is like lytic lesions of the phalanges, and then of course, cancer. Now, the treatment with acute exposures is to decontaminate the patients and supportive, so bronchodilators for their pneumonitis symptoms and benzos for seizures. They're a lot more dangerous to 60s fashion. <laughs> yes, there are a lot more dangerous to that. Well, thank you, Wendy, for taking the time to go through this issue with me. I learned a lot and had a great time. Our dear listeners, we hope you had as much fun listening to us as we've had recording this. And we hope that you find the Critical Decisions publication and our podcast always informative, often enlightening, and never boring. Share your thoughts with us on social media. My Twitter handle is at Danya Koja. Mine is at EM underscore NCC. And on Instagram, it's at Dr. Danya Koja. And my Instagram handle is at Dr. Wendy Chang. And until next month, bye-bye.